Welcome to the Astronomical League video sessions. My name is John Goss, former president of the Astronomical League. This program is one of a series of presentations in conjunction with the 75th anniversary of the League. It was founded on November 15th, 1946, with just under 1,500 members. Today, I've just found out we have just under 21,000 members spread across the United States, as well as a number of international membership. The League is most well known for its many observing programs, which range from observing objects in the solar system, like the moon and planets and sun, which we'll get to in just a moment, uh, to deep space objects such as uh, star clusters, nebula, galaxies, and so on. But today we're gonna to be talking about the Hydrogen Alpha Solar Observing Program. We have with us Mark Simonson, the program coordinator uh, and also member of the Everett Astronomical Society. Mark, would you like to say a few words about the program, how to get started, and what it takes to do it, and any other details about it that you would want to give to us? Absolutely. Um, I'm also a member of the Olympic Astronomical Society. I belong to two. So I'm the LCOR for the Everett Astronomical Society. But we're here to talk about the Hydrogen Alpha Solar Observing Program. Please ignore the uh, separation on that slide. That first slide there is uh, the certificate if you uh, do all of the requirements and the picture of the sun there, that's the, uh, that's the pin, a little bit smaller than that though. Okay, first off, you're observing the sun. So there's a whole bunch of warnings. If you are even a little bit shaky on your equipment, don't trust it, don't use it. Always caution to the to safety first. Um, as Richard uh, Hill states in Observe the Sun and Understand the Sun, observing the sun is the only inherently dangerous observing an amateur astronomer can do. You can really ruin your eyes very quickly and very easily. Um, also, one of the things that I've done, I've done quite a bit of uh, solar observing. I tend to forget to put my guide scope caps on. So I get little burns here and there. So make sure that you do that every time. And like I said, don't use, uh, don't use equipment that you don't trust 100%. And don't use the old filters, solar filters that screw onto the end of the eyepieces. So those things tend to crack and more than one person has ruined their eyes because of that. Okay, we're talking about hydrogen alpha light versus white light. If you look to the left on the slide there, you've got a picture. The far left is uh, hydrogen alpha light. And on the right hand side is the uh, a white light photograph, just to show you the difference between the two. As you, one of the biggest things you'll notice is in hydrogen alpha, you can actually see the prominences on the limb of the, uh, of the soul of the sun, whereas white light, you can't see prominences. prominences. Uh, I also put a couple pins of some other Astronomical League programs on there to give them a little shout out. The Sunspotters, which is done in white light. Uh, Analemma, which is the uh, uh, more on the position of the sun at the same time every day for an entire year. Uh, stellar evolution, if you want to know what, why the sun acts the way it does and what makes up the sun, that's a great program for it. You look at all different kinds of stars, including G's type stars like the sun and the spectroscopy observing program, which uh, you do have to look at the, uh, the makeup of the uh, spectrograph of the sun in that program. Okay, right now we are just coming out of the solar minimum. Uh, it's an 11 year cycle. And the solar minimum was about July, or I'm sorry, April of 2020. And we'll hit solar maximum as projected for July of 2025. So if you're thinking about doing the observing or doing this observing program, this uh, hydrogen alpha, it's a good time to start because uh, every day it's starting to pick up more and more. More sunspots are showing up. Prominences really didn't go away. They got to a, a little bit of a minimum, but they were, there were quite a few there during the solar minimum. But now they're really going to increase and they're going to be very large. If you noticed over the last month, if you've been following the sun, uh, some of the prominences have been just absolutely huge. And on the right, you can see the difference in activity between a solar minimum and a solar maximum. Okay, the history of the program. It hasn't been around for very long, since uh, 2013. 
Vincent Foster was the first coordinator from 2013 to 2016. Aaron Clevenson was 2017, and in 2018, I started uh, doing it. Uh, the observing program is considered to be an intermediate experience level program. So far, 55 individuals have earned their certificate in the PIN. You can use either manual or device-aided uh, uh, mount to, uh, to track the sun or just to move it over on by hand. Uh, you can do the program visually or through imaging photography, and it requires some specialized equipment. Uh, hydrogen alpha, if you look through a regular telescope uh, without a, just a, a white light filter, you're not going to see the things that you can with the, with a hydrogen alpha filter. And there's different types of telescopes and filters, which we'll get into. Quick view of the requirements. This is telescope only. I guess you could use solar uh, white light, but it wouldn't be hydrogen alpha for binoculars, so it'd be useless. Uh, manual or device aided. Uh, remote telescopes are a no-go in this program. You have to do the, uh, the observing yourself. Visual or imaging. Uh, number of levels, there's only one. The number of observations, there's only 40. You must be an uh, Astronomical League member, a member at large, something like that, or with a, a society. And uh, recommended minimum instrument size is 40 millimeters. Uh, when it gets to the observation requirements, uh, you have to all of the, these are almost all the same basic ones for uh, just about every observing program. Um, the name or number of the object that you're observing, in this case, it might be a, a prominence, a certain type, something like that. Um, your latitude, your longitude, the date of the observation, either local time or universal time, a description of the object, and so forth. Okay, what is hydrogen alpha? Well, I, in fact, when I set up my telescope, my hydrogen alpha telescope, or my uh, eyepiece, which I have a quark, which we'll look at in a minute, one of the first things people ask is, why is it called hydrogen alpha? Well, hydrogen alpha, per the definition, is a specific deep red visible spectral line in the Balmer series with a wavelength of 656.28 nanometers in air. It occurs when a hydrogen electron falls from its third to its second lowest energy level. Hydrogen alpha light is the brightest hydrogen line in the visible spectral range. It is important to astronomers as it is emitted by many emission nebula and can be used to observe features in the sun's atmosphere, including solar prominences and the chronosphere. Uh, on the left-hand side there, you can see a picture uh, you could imagine that as a hydrogen atom with the nucleus in the middle and then the orbit of the electron. And what happens when it's emitting a photon at 656.28 nanometers, it's dropping from the level three to the level two. So think of that as like a, like a mini solar system. And that's the orbit of the moon. Well, it moves in a little closer, uses less energy, so it emits a photon. And that's the red photon that we see at that wavelength. In the center there, hydrogen, as we know, is the most abundant uh, element in the, in the sun. And all of those are different wavelengths for, uh, for hydrogen. There's the Lyman series, which is ultraviolet. We can't see that. There's the Balmer series, which is in the visible spectrum. And that's where hydrogen alpha falls in. And then there's the Pashan series, which is in infrared. There's a couple others, but I'm not going to get into those. They're, they're much more in depth. And then you can see the spectral lines on the right-hand side and what nanometer. So if it's a hydrogen emission spectrum, it's on the bottom. If it's an absorption where it's jumping from level N2, N3, I'm sorry, N2 up to level N3, it's absorbing that energy instead of emitting it. I hope that explains it. Send me an email with questions if it doesn't. Uh, here we're getting into some of the specialized equipment. Uh, the one on the left is a Coronado personal solar telescope. You can actually get the entire, which depending on which eyepiece you use, you can get the entire solar disk in there. And those tend to have a sweet spot somewhere in the middle. And if you move around around the edge, you can actually 
get a lot of the prominent prominences, the larger ones, and you can see a lot of the uh, surface detail in the chromosphere. Excuse me, on the far right hand side, that's a lump telescope, which is set up strictly for hydro. And then the one in the middle is a cork um, day star, which is an eyepiece that goes onto a regular refractor, uh, usually 120 millimeters and smaller. Otherwise, you have to get a special lens for the end. But it, it's a powered eyepiece and uh, it doesn't heat up. So you're not going to, there's no chance that you're going to ruin your telescope because before it gets to that point, it's going up this eyepiece and it, it, it just doesn't heat up. I've, I've, I was so worried about that because I have a cork and I have it on a hundred millimeter uh, Skywatcher um, Esprit and there's no heat at all. I was really surprised. So, but it does give you some awesome, awesome pictures. Okay, the program itself. There's three parts to the observing program. The first part is you observe, have to observe two solar rotations. The second part is you have to sketch or photograph 14 prominences, different types of prominences. And the third part is you have to sketch or photograph six chromosphere features. Okay, on the first part, uh, two solar rotations. Uh, as you can see on the little graph on the right, the sun rotates, it's, it's not a solid like the earth is. It's a, a plasma and a whole bunch of, uh, it, it's almost, think of it as almost like a liquid or a gaseous giant that's on fire <laughs> or that's uh, emitting radiation. Um, and it rotates at different uh, speeds the equator's 25 days up towards the poles, 35 days, and in between. And that's what causes a lot of the, uh, mag um, the magnetism flux and everything, and a lot of the reason why we get uh, sunspots, uh, why you get the big arches and the big prominences, that's all the magnetism and the, the plasma following those, those magnet magnetic lines. I threw in a picture of the, uh, at the bottom, right below that little graph of a penumbra and an umbra. With hydrogen alpha, it's very, very difficult to see the penumbra. So it's something that you won't, won't usually sketch, but you will see the umbra um, because of the contrast uh, in hydrogen alpha and, but versus white light. It's very hard to see the penumbra. And the, Pro, the program itself for the Astronomical League, when you're doing it, they request that you record what the Carrington rotation commencement date is for that particular rotation. Um, you can Google Carrington rotation uh, dates and you'll see a little graph like the one right below where it says Google there. And it'll give you the start date and the end date for that uh, rotation with the rotation number to the left. Going back during that, uh, during those two rotations, you have to make at least uh, 20 sketches of the entire disk. And you'll see those in, as examples in a, a couple of slides to follow. But the entire disk with all the features on it, you don't have to label them. You can label them if you want to, but we want to see the entire disk and how, uh, how items on the, in the chronosphere and prominences move during that, uh, that, those rotations. The second part is uh, you have to sketch all 14 prominences. They're pretty easy to pick out once you, once you see them. There's the single arch, a double arch, broken arch, unconnected arch, straight pillar, curved pillar, inclined pillar, mound, hedgerow, pyramid, broken pyramid, fork, detached, and anomalous. One of the things that I did is I would haul out my equipment every single day, set it up, look at the sun, and then realize, oh, there's no prominences today. Go out the next day. I might go two, three days and just get one prominence. And it may be one that I already have. I'm going to show you at the end of this presentation, there's a website that you can go to um, called the Gong. Gong is what I call it. And it shows what's going on on the sun in hydrogen alpha light at that exact moment every single day. 
So you can gauge whether you need to set up your equipment or not from that. So, and you must either sketch or photograph all 14 prominences. The one that I found that was uh, one of the hardest to find in here was the hedgerow. All of the others, I had many, many different uh, examples of it. And you have to photograph or sketch six chromosphere features from the disk of the, of the sun. Uh, here, there are nine listed here, filaments, spicules, flares, element bombs, uh, plage, field transition arches, emerging flux regions, sunspots, and active regions. Like I said, you only have to uh, photograph or sketch six of the nine that are listed. And once you've done all that, you've actually completed uh, the program. I'm gonna show you here. This is an example of one of the Astronomical League members and uh, their observation logs with sketches. Uh, I don't have any examples of, uh, of imaging. In fact, I'm doing imaging now, but I haven't added it in here. Um, you can see the top one is a double arch, so it's one of his prominences. The bottom one on the left-hand side is the full disk with everything on it. And the one on the right-hand side is the field transition arch, which is part of the chronosphere. And then these were my some of my logs when I did it back into uh, 2014, or when it first came out. You see my top one is the entire... Uh, the entire solar disk. And that was during solar maximum too. So you can see how, my, how many features and prominences there are on any given day. Um, the bottom one is a broken arch. And then the right one was a, uh, what was that? That was a solar flare and uh, sunspots. Okay, submitting your observations for certification. You do not have to send me the entire, uh, all of your sketches or anything like that. You can actually go through your society awards coordinator, have them check it off or someone that's done the program before and knows what they're looking at. Have them uh, send me an email and maybe with a sample of one picture or something and I'll approve it from there uh, with them having checked everything to make sure that all the all of the requirements were met. This is what I was talking about, the Gong Network. Uh, it's a global oscillation network group, um, Gong. <laughs> and if you click on, if you look at the uh, left portion, there's a hydrogen alpha right there, that uh, deep red sun. When you click on that, you get a bunch of different areas around the world. Uh, this one that's on the right-hand slide is, uh, where is that? That is Big Bear. I believe that's down in California, one of the solar observing uh, stations down there. And it shows what prominences are on there, what surface features are in the chromosphere for that day. That's it. That was really quick. <laughs> Question? Yes, Mark, I've got a question. And uh -huh. uh, I uh, earned the, the uh, pen and certificate, uh, I think 2015, 2014, something like that. And my big question when I got in there is uh, what equipment did I need? Now you showed those different uh, pieces of equipment. What is the most economical? Would that be the PST? The PST is, is definitely the most economical and you can do the entire program with that very easily. In fact, wow. uh, if you purchase uh, PST also, or uh, it's Coronado that makes it, they sell uh, four different eyepieces for that. And one of them I believe is a, a 12 or nine millimeter. And it gives you a really good view of a specific area if there's a prominence or something like that. That's yeah, the that's, one that- uh... That's Pardon? the one that I've got, and that's the one that I, I did the entire program with, with that telescope. I will say that uh, for those who are uh, thinking about investing, I do wish that I had invested in a larger one, like uh, what, what's the 
uh, it was on the right hand side of the oh, screen. Oh, the, the lung, the lungs make large. You know, I've looked through those at uh, uh, public events, and I'm just I, I love that telescope. I, yeah. Several times I've thought about selling the PST in order to <laughs> justify to my wife, yeah, I am getting another telescope, but I'm getting rid of one. Well, the maker but of the PST for uh, people who are, are thinking about getting into this program. Uh, the maker of the PST Coronado, they also make what's called the Solar Max, which is a much larger telescope. And yeah. uh, but you're talking about much larger prices also, those right. uh, because hydrogen alpha the filters tend to be very very expensive. Um, what I liked about the Quark, I I did the program with the PST like you did, and I bought the Quark later because I want to I want to image the entire program. And then use the images as details for for people that want to do the program. Um, the cork, like I said, I can put it on my hundred millimeter uh, Esprit from Sky uh, Skywatcher, and it it'll zoom in easily as close as that picture that you see on the left there. I mean, it'll really zoom in on the prominences and everything. Let me ask a little bit more about that system. <clears throat> uh, Am I understanding you correctly that you can basically put that on any telescope? Uh, it has to be on a refractor. It on can't refractor. be on a reflector. Okay. A reflector will heat up. It and has to be a refractor. And I believe the maximum without an additional filter for the front end of the refractor is 120 millimeters or it could be 150 millimeters but they do sell a separate uh it's a, some sort of blocker that stops any heat from getting in okay okay but what i do with my esprit 100 is i just plug it in you have to use a diagonal because it, it needs that distance sort of like uh back right. focus when you're doing imaging it needs that distance and it also needs power so you have to have some sort of portable battery or a, the ability to plug it in the house or in your observatory or wherever you're at. Um, and then you put an eyepiece on top of that, or you can hook up a camera on top of it like I'm doing. Yeah. And it, it takes that system a couple of minutes to warm up once you get going because the power, it actually heats it up on the inside of the eyepiece in some way. I never yeah. have understood how it does it, but the, the views from that, are they're quite a bit better than the PST, but the PST is still great. I loved the PST when I was doing it. And I still use the PST now, especially for outreach and stuff so people can see the sun. Yeah, the outreach is the one hesita hes hesitation about me getting rid of the PST. But uh, uh, what's the price range of uh, that IPC you're talking about? That's the Quark, Quark, yeah. Quark Daystar, they usually run, uh, you can get them on cloudy nights and that around $1,000. Okay. Um, brand new, I believe they're twelve dollars to $1,300. Whereas the PST brand new is about $700. Right. I've seen them on cloudy nights for five, dollars $600. Yeah. Yeah, the hydrogen alpha is pricey. <laughs> Mark, you, you were commenting about solar minimum versus solar max about about how many features could you see during solar minimum at a time how many features at a time uh solar max you appear to be able to see a number of features on the sun at any particular session solar minimum you could have zero features for 30 days so luckily we're getting out of that so if you want to do the hydrogen alpha observing program now's the time to get started because we're starting to get features every day now um I remember one enormous sunspot when I was doing mine, and there were probably 25 features in the chronosphere. And then the, the prominences around the edge, there had to have been 30 plus. And what's funny is you'll see a filament on the chronosphere. As that gets to the edge, that could be an arch or something else. It's just that you're looking at it straight on from above. So it doesn't look like a prominence until it gets over to the edge, and then you can actually see the arc and everything. Right. But at, at any given time, when we did, when I did it on Solar Max, there were fifty plus items on there. Hmm. 
But like I said, the hardest one for me to get as far as prominence was the head trauma. Mm -hmm. For some reason, it just didn't want to happen. Whatever that and that's, is. That's when I used the uh, gong, um, the gong network. And I saw one day it was on there and ran out with my equipment and drew it real fast. Uh, what, what type of magnification are these eyepieces giving? I know you said something about 12, 12 millimeters. I think they're, I believe the lowest one is, it may be 9, 12, uh, 20, and 25 mm -hmm. in the kit that you get from PST. And you can use regular eyepieces too, but these, those four eyepieces, they're specifically made for that. So they bring out just a, just a hair bit more detail. Can you always attach the old Barlow lens? Actually, I was mistaken. There are three eyepieces and one Barlow lens in that kit. It's 12, 20 and 25 and a Barlow lens, mm -hmm. something along those lines. But I use my quirk so much. It's been a while since I did the PST. So, so if if somebody uh, tackles this program and completes it, what what are their steps in getting the information to you and getting a certificate and pin? If if they photograph it or they sketch it, just uh, scan it, throw it in a PDF, and email it to me. Um, I usually respond, unless I'm over in Eastern Washington, up in the mountains, I'll respond within a day or two. If I get an email that morning, I'll respond by that evening easily. Um, it might take me a day or, or a little bit of time to get free to go over everything. However, they don't have to do that. If they're LCOR, their Astronomical League Coordinator for their society, or one of their members has completed the, this program, um, they can go through it and send me an email that all the requirements were met. And I'll go ahead and uh, take care of everything from there. Excellent. Um, Maynard, any more questions on your end? No. Uh, Mark, I appreciate uh, this. I'm trying to think in the mindset of someone who's just starting this program. And I think you've given uh, such folks a, a good uh, a description of, of what they need to do. Yeah. If I were to start it today, the first thing I would do is. Uh, I start saving for a PST, probably a used one, um, or like in my uh, my society, the Everett Astronomical Society. Since I have a PST, anybody in my society, I'll lend it out to them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there may be one in your society. So ask around. Yeah, the best works. telescopes I've ever used were in the club. Other people's, exactly. Yeah, other people's <laughs> cheap, but at the time. Uh, I think the PST was fairly new, and uh, yeah, uh, so uh, I went ahead and bought one. But you'd still recommend the PST as the starting point? Then. I would for this program. I definitely would. If you were going to try to do it imaging, I would recommend the Quark or the Solar Max or one of the the larger ones, which are yeah. quite a bit more expensive. But uh, like I said, the first thing I would do is I would try to get my hands on a PST. Um, one of the problems that one of the things that I didn't like was constantly moving it because I, I tend to sketch everything that I do or that I observe. Or back then I did. Now I try to photograph everything that I observe. But uh, constantly moving it. So I got uh, Skywatcher's uh, solar uh, mount, which you just turn that thing on and it finds the sun. And it'll stick right on there. You pinpoint it onto a specific yeah. area on the sun. It'll stay on there till the sun sets. So, and that's that's probably three to four hundred dollars, but it is well worth it. You can sit there in a lawn chair and sketch all day long, and you're going to be on the same exact spot the whole time. That's good. So, very good piece of equipment. If I was to go back, I would definitely get that, the PST, and I would have uh, I would have observed or gone on to the gong network to see what was going on that day instead of setting everything up and realizing oh there's nothing there which is dangerous when it's solar minimum solar max maximum there's always going to be something there yeah so, and and this is one of the few astronomy programs where what you're looking at changes by the minute mm -hmm. so a prominence may be a big arc at first and you look back 
10 minutes later and it's a broken arc or it's turned into a pyramid or something like that. So this changes quite a bit and quite quickly. So keep on observing, just, just don't take a brief look for 30 seconds at something. Exactly. You know, go for 20 minutes and you may see something totally entirely different. Oh, if, I, if I set up the equipment, I'm gonna be out there for a couple hours. I'm not gonna go for 20 minutes. So. In the hot sun, in the hot sun. Well, in the hot sun, yes. Thank you, Mark, for, for presenting this, putting it all together and showing it to us. Um, I, I think you, you really answered a lot of people's questions and concerns. Um, you went over the, the safety issue, you went over the equipment, you went over the, the, the observing and then the recording and the submission of your, of your records. So it, it's a program which we can do. You know, um, not too many years ago, something like this wouldn't have been really doable for a lot of people. Well, part of it was because hydrogen alpha, the filters and, and everything like that was just out of the amateur's price range and it's come down quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's something that people can jump into these days and I expect a lot more people will because daytime is half the day and that's half the observing opportunities you have. So exactly. This is great. Okay. And I'm up in the Pacific Northwest. So uh, <laughs> any sunlight or clear skies that we get, we take advantage of them. Western Washington, you just know, you never know. That's it. You never know. Well, th thank you again for, for, for doing this. And um, we'll be doing more of these programs in the next few weeks. And um, people like, like Mark, they've volunteered for the league, really volunteered for all of amateur astronomy to help bring these interesting uh, programs to everybody out there. Uh, so please, uh, you know, if you like this stuff, jump, jump, jump right in. Contact Mark if you have any questions. I'm sure he'll be happy to set, set you on the straight and narrow, figure out what's oh, yeah. going on. And we hope you have a great time enjoying, a great time enjoying uh, observing. So on that note, Mark Maynard Pittendre, he's with us on, on the call today. He's uh, Executive Secretary of the Astronomical League, so I appreciate him chiming in and asking a few questions here. Um, unless that's it, we'll see you. Thank you all for, for joining us today. Uh.